Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am preaching to you this morning from my kitchen table because uh, I, Natalie, and Ezra, we all got sick this week. So we are hunkering down here at home, resting up, and hopefully be feeling, feeling pretty normal here in a few days. So thank you for your prayers. Um, we appreciate that. Anyways, if you've been with us over the past few months, uh, from time to time, we've been looking at the book of the prophet Malachi. And so far in the book, we've seen Malachi confront the Judeans doubting of God's love and begrudgery in God's worship and faithlessness toward God's covenant and challenging of God's justice and stinginess in God's offering. And now this morning, we come to Malachi's final confrontation of the Judeans' apathy toward God's law. Their apathy toward his law. And if you don't know, apathy or being apathetic is basically, basically an emotional state where you are lacking interest in or are indifferent toward or are unmoved by something. So kids, if one of your neighbors comes over and knocks on your front door and says, hey, do you want to come out and play? But you respond, uh, I don't know. I think I'd rather just sit on the couch and watch TV. That's a kind of apathy where the thought of getting up and doing something just doesn't excite you or energize you. You'd just rather not. Teenagers, if your attitude towards school is basically, I just don't care. I don't care that my grades are suffering. I don't care that I'm missing homework. I just don't care. That's a kind of apathy where, where the thought of applying yourself and taking some ownership of your education just doesn't excite you or energize you. You'd just rather not. Adults, if you keep thinking day after day after day, man, I really should start reading my Bible. But day after day after day, you don't. And it just sits there collecting dust. That's a kind of apathy where the thought of carving out some time in your day to hear from God just doesn't excite you or energize you. You'd just rather not. So while apathy isn't always a bad thing, oftentimes it can be, right? Oftentimes it can be symptomatic of some deeper issue. And it's definitely not the ideal emotional state to always be in, right? I mean, at least for me, I would much rather be passionate and feeling and interested toward things in my life instead of just moping around everywhere like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. Dispassionate, unfeeling, uninterested, no excitement, no energy, no joy. And in our passage this morning, we're going to see a people who just aren't excited or energized by the thought of following and obeying God. They're spiritually apathetic. They're like spiritually couch-ridden kids or spiritually careless teenagers or spiritually casual and comfortable adults who have no fire under them or in them, who have no passion, who have no joy. And if there's anyone here this morning who's already beginning to think, man, that sounds like me. Because in all honesty, following God feels like a chore to me. It's not a life-giving thing to me. It's not a joy-filling thing to me. I feel spiritually apathetic, and I know I shouldn't, and I wanna feel differently. If that's you this morning, then the good news is that you're in the right place. Because this word from Malachi is for you. And I believe that the Almighty God, through the power of his word, applied to your heart by the Holy Spirit, 
I believe that the Almighty God can change your heart and can give you a renewed sense of spiritual enthusiasm and delight in him. And if you believe he can do it, and if you ask him to do it, I believe that he will. So if that is your posture before the Lord this morning, then pray with me now and let's ask him for his help. Okay. Lord God, may we behold wondrous things from your holy, inspired, inerrant word. Lord, I know that there is much hope. There is much hope, even for the spiritually lukewarm and even for the spiritually lifeless. Lord, you are the God who created the world, who parted the Red Sea and can heal the sick and can raise the dead. Lord, you certainly have all power in your hands to change an apathetic heart, to set it on fire and to make it beat with love for you. So Lord, I pray that for those who have come into this place this morning feeling spiritually like one of those one of those corpses in Ezekiel's Valley of Dry Bones, Lord, I pray that you and your mercy would send your spirit to wake them up and to give them life. And Lord, may your grace shown to us in this way return back to you in an outpouring of praise from us, your people, Lord. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn in it to the very last book of the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Malachi. And then turn in Malachi to the very end of the book, and we'll be reading the prophet's final words which are also the final words of the Old Testament in chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verse 6. Again, that's chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verse 6. And let me read it. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said... It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For, behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its, in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So there is a lot here in this passage, and I know it might be difficult to make much sense of it all, so let me begin to help us piece it together with an outline. So you'll see that I've 
broken up this passage into three main sections. Uh, in section one, we see the descriptions of two types of people in Judah, chapter three, verses 13 through 18. And those two types of people are the pragmatists, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. The pragmatists, verses 13 through 15, and the God-fearers, verses 16 through 18. Two descriptions. And then in section two, we see the destinies of these two types of people. Chapter four, verses one through three, and those two destinies are destruction, verse one, and restoration, verses two through three. Two destinies. And then lastly, in section three, we see two directions given in application to these two types of people. Chapter four, verses four through six. And the first direction is look back, verse four. And the second direction is look forward, verses five through six. Okay, so we've got two descriptions, two destinies, and two directions. So beginning under section one, let's first look at the description of the pragmatists, chapter three, verses 13 through 15. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. So these pragmatists, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, these, these pragmatists are saying that it is vain to serve God. It is vain to serve him. And this, this word in the Hebrew means something like empty. So we might think of it this way. Have you ever reached into the fridge and have grabbed the milk or the juice and the container has like half a millimeter of liquid in it. So then you think to yourself, what the heck, who used this last and decided that it was a good idea to put this back in the fridge without just finishing it? Well, that's how some of the Judeans feel about serving God. Oh, it sounds good and it looks good, but it's deceptively empty. And then these Judeans spell out exactly what they mean by this emptiness, saying, what is the profit of our keeping his charge? What is there to gain in obeying God? How is obeying God of any benefit to us? Have you ever felt that way? You've wondered, how is it a benefit to me to obey God in this situation? Like, how is it a benefit to me being honest with my parents about this? Or how is it a benefit to me staying home and not going out with these friends? Or how is it a benefit to me closing my ears to this when everything inside of me wants to listen? Or shutting my mouth about this when everything inside of me wants to speak? Or looking away from this when everything inside of me wants to look? Or how is it a benefit to me confessing this sin to my spouse, which will destroy him or her? Add up enough of these things and you can begin to feel very apathetic toward following and obeying God. Add up enough of these things and you can begin to wonder, what's the point? Wouldn't it be better for me to just do what I want to do and what I think is best? And of course, what makes these feelings even worse is seeing people in the world who completely disregard God and his laws entirely and yet seem to be doing pretty well. And this is precisely what the Judeans say in verse 15. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. We thought the equation was obedience plus faithfulness equals divine blessing, Lord. But it turns out that it's just every man for himself out here. 
And there is no advantage in serving you because you are unjust. You don't give us what we deserve and you don't give them what they deserve. What emptiness in following you. And all this is why I'm calling these particular Judeans pragmatists. Because pragmatism is a philosophy which says that a thing is right or good if it works practically. And for the Judeans, serving God isn't really working for them. It doesn't seem to be particularly useful to them. It doesn't seem to be particularly beneficial to them. And so, it isn't good, and it shouldn't be done. But then, then we read about a different group of people in Judah who have a totally different attitude and who fear the Lord or revere the Lord, verses 16 through 18. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession. And I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So let me point out just three things here. First, in heaven, in the presence of God, a book of remembrance is written before him of the names of the individuals who feared him. And this is really significant because it shows us that even when we feel all alone, like an island in the midst of a sea of people, who've become faithless or who have caved theologically and have embraced false doctrines, even when we feel all alone and we wonder if God even sees us or cares, we see here that he does see and he does care and he knows us by name and he takes note of our every refusal to flirt with any form of ungodliness. Which leads us to the second point. These kinds of people make up what God calls his treasured possession. His treasured possession. In other words, the thing God values most, the thing he considers to be of greatest worth is not silver or gold, not the stars or the galaxies, not anything else in all creation, but those who fear him. They are his treasure. They are those pearls of great price, if you know what I mean. And thirdly, these kinds of people will ultimately be spared as a man spares his son. Do you remember the story of Abraham and Isaac hiking up Mount Moriah? Isaac carrying the wood for a sacrifice upon his own back and eventually looking up at his dad asking, Father, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham, probably holding back tears, saying, God will provide. And they get to the top of the mountain and they build an altar, and then Abraham lays his son upon it. And just before he comes down with the knife, God intervenes saying, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy. And then Abraham looks up and sees a ram caught in a thicket. God has provided a substitutionary sacrifice for sin. So then what does Abraham do? Does he say, oh no, Lord, it's fine, it's fine. Let's just stick with the original plan. No. 
of course not. He probably breathes the biggest sigh of relief that any human being has ever experienced. And then he reaches down to his son and picks him up off the altar and hugs him tight saying, oh, Isaac, Isaac, my son. Oh, I will never, ever let you go. Abraham is overjoyed to spare his son when God sends the ram to die in his place. And so is the Lord. He is overjoyed to spare his people when he sends his son, the spotless lamb of God, to die in their place. So that's what God has to say about these God-fearers. They are ones who are taken note of and are treasured and will ultimately be spared as a man spares his son. And then we move into section two, which begins by showing us the destructive destiny of the pragmatists. Chapter four, verse one. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. The picture is, is that of a forest fire completely consuming all the trees that bore bad fruit. Now, you might be wondering, well, wait a minute, why is Dylan lumping together the pragmatists with these arrogant evildoers? Aren't they different people? And the answer to that question is kind of, but not really. Not really. And, and the next two verses make this clearer, where we see the restorative destiny of the God-fearers, verses 2 and 3. But for you who fear my name... So, so God is distinguishing just two categories here. Those who fear him and those who don't. It's very black and white. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. So this healing, this restoration, this thing that will make men leap with joy is for those who fear God's name. And everyone else belongs in the other category. And, and I love this picture God uses here of the rising sun. Man, what a great picture. I mean, just, just think about how scary and uncertain and hopeless things can be in the dark. There's a good reason the saying is, things go bump in the night, right? Because it's the darkness where creepy things hide. And it's the darkness where things disappear. And it's the darkness where we cannot see. And so it's illuminating, pun intended, that Jesus reveals himself in John chapter 8 to be what? The light of the world, saying, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So, so what I'm getting at here is that the S-U-N of righteousness described here in Malachi is really the S-O-N of righteousness. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And Jesus shines with such brilliance and glory that his sheer presence banishes the darkness and melts his enemies like wax. And when he returns, it will be like the sun coming up over the horizon after a long night. And for some who hate the light and love the darkness, some will see it and will run in terror like cockroaches desperately trying to scurry away from the light back into the shadows. But others 
who love the light and hate the darkness, others will see it and will go out leaping, jumping for joy, and will bask in its wonderful warmth. And so to summarize, before we move into our applications, God is giving the descriptions of two types of people who have two different destinies. The first is the kind of person who's come to the conclusion that following God doesn't work pragmatically or practically. It seems to be of no use. It seems to be of no benefit. And so it's an empty pursuit. And God says that these fruitless people will ultimately be destroyed. But the second is the kind of person who fears the Lord and, and who wants to follow him no matter what. The kind of person who does not waver in obedience even when particular outcomes turn out differently than expected. The kind of person who does not allow his circumstances to dictate the degree to which he is willing to trust God. The kind of person who does not abandon the path of righteousness, even when the path of wickedness looks better. And God says that these fruitful people will ultimately be restored. So then in the last section, section three, we see two directions, two applications given to both the pragmatists and the God-fearers. And, and I think God's intention through these applications is twofold. First, to wake the pragmatists up out of their apathy, to wake the pragmatists up, and second, to warn the God-fearers against apathy. To warn the God-fearers. And so, as you and I look at these applications, hopefully, by the grace of God, we'll sense the Holy Spirit either trying to wake us or to warn us. Okay, so let's look at the, the first application, which is the direction to look back, verse 4. Remember, this is a looking back word, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb, or Sinai, same place, for all Israel. So what's the wake-up message here for the pragmatists? And what's the warning message here for the God-fearers? Well, for the pragmatists, I think this direction is about more than just remembering what God's laws are. Okay, I think it's about more than just remembering what the Ten Commandments are and what the sacrificial laws are and what the ceremonial laws are. In other words, I don't think God's primary message here is just remember the rules. And why? Because simply reminding a sinner of the rules won't melt his hardened heart and produce in him passion and feeling and joy and all the opposites of apathy. But you know what will melt a hardened heart? A story about a people. In fact, these pragmatists' very ancestors, a story about a people who were once enslaved and subjected under the law of a tyrannical pharaoh in Egypt. But then were rescued and set free from that bondage and brought up out of that land of death and then set under the law of a good king. In other words, I think God wants these pragmatists to remember his law 
in the historical context in which it was given, which is why he makes mention of Moses and Horeb. He wants them to remember how he stirred up Moses to demand that Pharaoh let his people go and how he parted the Red Sea and how he destroyed their pursuing enemies and redeemed his people unto himself. In a word, he wants his people to remember that his law was preceded by his grace. In fact, if we read Exodus chapter 19, just before the law is given in chapter 20 at Horeb, we see God saying this, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Grace. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples. Law. And similarly, Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 15 says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Grace. Therefore, I command you this today. Law. And similarly, Leviticus eleven forty five 45 says, For I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. Grace. You shall, therefore, be holy. For I am holy. What I'm trying to show you here is that God doesn't give his law without first reminding his people of his grace. And why? Because it's his grace which melts hardened hearts. And it's his grace which inspires passion and joy, and all the opposites of apathy. And it's his, it's his grace which shows us that he is good and so worthy to be trusted and followed and obeyed. Amen? And, and you and I might look to the Exodus and be woken up out of our apathy just to see how gracious the Lord was to the ancient Israelites. But you know what? We have an even closer example. And we have an example that actually involves each and every one of us. You see, the Exodus was a type and picture of an even greater Exodus that God would later accomplish through Christ. A liberation of God's people from the slavery of their own sin. Left to ourselves. We could never escape our sin, just like the Israelites couldn't escape Egypt. But by a divine miracle, Jesus, in his death, parted our sea of sin, which separated us from the holy God, and left our sin behind to be swept away, and brought us up out of that death into life so that we could walk in spiritual freedom under the rule of a good king. And so, pragmatists, here's your application. Look back and remember that the good king, God the Father, loved you enough to sacrifice his own son for you, to rescue you, to free you, to save you from your own sin which had enslaved you. And may the love of God shown to you in this way Move your heart away from apathy to willful and cheerful and trusting obedience. Let me say that one more time. Look back and remember that the good king loved you enough to sacrifice his own son for you, to rescue you, to free you, to save you from your own sin, which had enslaved you. And may the love of God shown to you in this way. Move your heart away from apathy to willful and cheerful and trusting obedience. And for the God-fearers, here's your application here. Look back to the cross and remember that it was there that the victory was won 
and your sin was defeated, and Christ shouted, it is finished, so that you will not be destroyed or tempted to apathy when you stumble and fall into sin. Let me say that one one more time as well. Look back to the cross and remember that it was there that the victory was won and your sin was defeated. And Christ shouted, it is finished, so that you will not be destroyed or tempted to apathy when you stumble and fall into sin. Listen, if you mistakenly think that your standing with God is based on your performance, your your track record of obedience, then every time you stumble and fall into sin, you'll be so tormented by your guilt that you may grow apathetic and even trying to keep on following God at all because you just keep messing up and never seem to get it right. But if you keep looking back to the cross, you'll keep being reminded that Christ is the Savior, not you. And he gave it all and paid it all, dying a sinner's death to cover your sins so that you would be spared of the death that you deserve and would be ushered safely from this life into the next, clothed in his righteousness, not your own. And so, God-fearer, even when you feel like you are drowning in sin and your life is slipping away, know that there is an ocean floor called grace beyond which you will never sink because of the cross. And so, keep looking back to that cross. Keep looking back to that cross. So then there's one more application, one more direction, and that is the direction to look forward, verses 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. Now, here's what's a little difficult. Uh, If we read Matthew chapter 11, we see Jesus saying that John the Baptist was this Elijah who was to come. Uh, Not that John the Baptist was a reincarnation of Elijah or anything weird like that, but John the Baptist was so much like Elijah, kind of like a second Elijah, that he's given this honorable title of Elijah. It's kind of like how some people call LeBron James the Michael Jordan of our day. Okay? But anyways, all this talk of the coming of Elijah and the coming of this great and awesome day of the Lord and the turning of the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers, if this is all pointing us forward to the ministry of John the Baptist, then it seems that all of this must have been fulfilled either in or around the days of Jesus, which would lead me to conclude that this great and awesome day of the Lord was probably referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred almost 500 years later from the time of Malachi in 70 AD, and which Jesus prophesied would happen in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Okay? However, we know that there is a great and awesome day of the Lord still to come. Right? There, there is a day that is coming when, on a global scale, every kingdom of man will finally crumble and every house built on the sand will finally be swept away and every unrepentant evildoer will finally be consumed as stubble when the light of the glory of the Son of Righteousness appears in his second coming. 
And so when I look at this prophecy here in Malachi, I see it as being only partially fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, which, which now serves as a type and picture of this even greater day of the Lord still to come when this prophecy will be fully fulfilled. Okay. So then the question is, what is the wake-up message here for the pragmatists today? And what is the warning message here for the God-fearers today? And I think the message for the pragmatists is simple. Look forward to this day that is coming for you. Repent and turn to the Lord before it's too late. Look forward to this day that is coming for you and repent and turn to the Lord before it's too late. Now, let me ask you a question. Can you remember a time in your life when a friend or a family member lovingly confronted you in your sin? And they didn't confront you to belittle you or to make you feel like a horrible person, but, but in an attempt to rescue you from the dangerous path that you were on, the one that was headed straight for a cliff, which you couldn't see, but they could. Well, in the same way, God, through this passage, is lovingly confronting you, pragmatist. He's trying to wake you up to the reality that you are headed straight for a cliff, and the drop is a long way down. And the only way to be spared of the death that you deserve because of your sin is to repent of that sin, turn away from that sin, and put your faith in Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was not spared, but was slaughtered for your sin, died for your sin, so that you could be forgiven and freed from that sin and could walk in newness of life with the Lord your God forever. Repent of your sin today and receive the free gift of God's grace in Jesus, pragmatist. And for the God-fearers, here's your application. Look forward to this great and awesome day so that you will not lose hope or be tempted to apathy when the darkness in the tunnel of life feels more powerful and all-consuming than the light that is coming at the end of the tunnel. Let me say that one more time. Look forward to this great and awesome day so that you will not lose hope or be tempted to apathy when the darkness in the tunnel of life feels more powerful and all-consuming than the light that is coming at the end of the tunnel. When the burden of your sin weighs you down, when your enemies triumph over you, when kids at school call you names and make fun of you, when your boss treats you badly, when your family disowns you, when the curse of sin is played out in your life, look forward and see the day when Christ is returning to reverse the curse completely, such that there will be no more mourning, no more pain, no more crying, no more sin, no more death, for all these former things will have passed away, swallowed up in the eternal victory of the King of Kings. Do you know what Jesus said to the mob when they came with Judas Iscariot to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, this is your hour. The enemies of Jesus will have their short hour. They will triumph for a moment, but the Lord of glory will have his day and he will triumph forever. You know, last time I flew out of SeaTac, 
it was cloudy and rainy, you know, just another dark and depressing day here in Western Washington. And our plane took off and we started climbing into the sky. And then when we passed through the clouds, the most incredible thing happened, which always happens, but it was the first time I really took notice of it. When we passed through the clouds, all of a sudden, all the darkness was gone. And all the clouds were behind us. And the light from the sun was shining so bright upon us. And it, it, it just reminds me that all the clouds we experience in this life, all the sin and suffering, failures and setbacks and distractions, all the clouds we experience in this life may obscure but cannot ever vanish the sun above who shines eternally in glorious splendor and majesty. And we just need to have the right perspective in order to see him there. And so hopefully our passage this morning is giving us this cosmic perspective. Hopefully it's lifting us up and is taking us through the clouds and is showing us the light of the world who has come and is coming again. And I'll just close by asking you, have you seen this great light? Has this great light dawned upon you? Do you tremble in holy fear and reverence before this great light? Do you love this great light and want to follow and obey this great light? And do you know, deep within your heart, that when this great light returns, you will go out leaping, jumping for joy, and will bask in its wonderful warmth for all eternity. Let me pray for us. Oh Lord, there is much in this life that might tempt us to apathy. Things go wrong, we go wrong, sins weigh heavy, burdens mount, and Lord, sometimes it all just makes us want to give up. Sometimes it makes us turn our back on you and run the other direction, thinking that there are answers elsewhere, thinking that there is life elsewhere, thinking that there is hope elsewhere. And Lord, they are all just mirages in the desert, which cannot satisfy, but can only kill. So Lord, my prayer for us is simple. Show us your glory and remind us of your grace. And may that either wake us up out of our apathy or warn us today against apathy. Oh Lord, I ask that you might be pleased to set us on fire with a passion to serve you, with a passion to follow you, and with a passion to obey you because you are so worthy. And Lord, you, you always have our best interests in mind. Lord, help us to really believe that. Well, Lord, we pray these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, and for your glory alone. Amen. Amen. Well, may we all go in the grace of God this morning.